Okay, so with the test Thursday, I've selected a short and uh, straightforward uh, section to do today. Um, so we're just going to take some of what we did um, last Thursday and generalize it. So last Thursday, we were looking at the second order linear equations. We can now ask, well, what if we have third order or fourth order or, you know, some order other than the two? So... These P's can be functions of X, but just as with second order, we're actually only going to solve um, equations with constant coefficients. But suppose we have a linear differential equation. So these are uh, these exponents are derivatives, remember, not powers, the nth derivative, the n minus first derivative, and so on. You wind up at the zeroth derivative, which is just the original function. And let's say this is equal to zero. So this is homogeneous. Well, when we were looking at second order equations like this, we said that solutions satisfy the superposition principle. If we can find solutions, we can put them all together and create a new solution. And good news, that was not some unique quirk of second order equations. The superposition principle holds for arbitrary order linear equations. Again, as long as they're homogeneous, that homogeneity is a necessary condition. So with um second order equations, we'd find two solutions. That's not a coincidence. We're going to solve third order equations and want three solutions, fourth order equations and want four solutions and so on. So let's say we've, we're looking at this nth order equation and we find N solutions. N solutions for nth order. The superposition principle says we can put these together. to create a new solution. And this solution is called general. And what we mean when we call it general is that any other solution can be written in this way by selecting the appropriate C1, C2, up to Cn. So this was true for second order. It remains true for nth order. Again, as long as you have that condition. But when we had 
second order equations, we talked about linear independence. The idea that if we're going to use two solutions to create a general solution, those that you really need two solutions. Having like the sine of x and five times the sine of x isn't going to cut it because those are essentially the same solution. And the way we formalized that idea was the notion of linear independence. We need linearly independent solutions. And here we're going to have to do something new. That's because the way we define linear independence for second order equations doesn't work well, doesn't work at all, I guess I should say, when you have more than two equations. The way we define linear independence, well, we, what we actually did was define dependence and then say if they're not dependent, they're independent. We said that two solutions were dependent. If one of them is a constant multiple of the other. And that works when you only have two functions. It doesn't work when you have more than two. Like let's say, we have cosine of x, the sine of x, and then the cosine of x plus the sine of x. Well, none of those functions is a constant multiple of the other functions, but it doesn't look like they should that like they're really independent. I mean, this, this third solution is built from the first two solutions using the superposition principle. So how can it be, how can it be independent? Well, it isn't. Um, None of these are constant multiples of one another, but they are not linearly independent. They are dependent on one another. And the way we generalize this so say we have n functions. These are called independent if the equation C1, F1 plus C2, F2 plus C3, F3 plus up to Cn, Fn is identically equal to zero. Has no solutions other than C1 equals zero, C2 equals zero, C3 equals zero, all the way up to Cn equals zero. 
was a zero. So, a few comments here. I guess the first comment is that it's possible you've gotten this far into your mathematical career and never seen this symbol before. That symbol means identically equal to. And here's what we're trying to emphasize. Like, one x, x squared. Let's say we're looking at these solutions. And we ask, are these solutions independent? Well, to decide if they're independent, we should look at these linear combinations. And if we just wrote an equal sign here, this looks like an equation that we solve in like a college algebra class. Something that we'd hit with the quadratic formula and say, well, this has two solutions and their negative C2 plus or minus the square root of C2 squared minus four times um, one, I mean, C1 times C3, all divided by two times C3, if I've got that right. What we're emphasizing when we write identically equal to is what we have on the left is a function. It's defined everywhere. What we have on the right is the constant zero function. It's defined everywhere. Are there values of C1, C2, and C3 that will make what we have on the left identical to what we have on the right. Now, we don't at least at this point have any, any technical tools for answering that question, but we can figure it out. What we have on the left is, okay, Desmos, ah, Desmos doesn't mind. And what we have on the right is the constant function y equals zero. And we ask, well, can we make this function here identically equal to this function here? Well, let's think this through. What we have up here is ordinarily a quadratic. A quadratic cannot be identically equal to zero because a quadratic can only have two roots at most, whereas this has infinitely many roots. So the only way this can happen is if this isn't actually a quadratic, and the only way for that to happen is if C3 is zero. But now we have, didn't mean to X that out. Now we have a linear function. And this linear function 
is only going to have one y-intercept. So is there any way we can make this be zero? Well, for this linear function, this straight line, to be identical to this zero function, this straight line, they'd need to have the same slope. So they'd need to both be horizontal, and that makes C2 be zero. And now for these straight lines to be identical, we have to move it down so that it covers the axis. And notice that the only way we were able to make this identically the same as this is by setting each of the coefficients equal to zero. And that means you have linear independence. Compare this to the sine of 2x, the sine of x times the cosine of x, and e to the x. Are these functions dependent or independent? Well, again, we don't really have any tools at this point for approaching that problem. But what we're asking is, can we select C1, C2, and C3 such that the function on the left is identically equal to the function on the right, and at least one of these Cs isn't zero. Let's find out. And let, let me make none of these be zero for a moment. C1 times the sine of 2x plus C2 times the sine of x times the cosine of x. Thus, most does not like this. What it wants us to do is put parentheses there. Plus C3. Let's see, we've got the sine of 2x plus C3 times e to the power of x. And now we want to make this identically equal to this zero function. And whether you can do this is just going to depend on... Uh, on how confident you are in your trigonometric identities, but this exponential clearly can't be there. I mean, this exponential is causing this curve to blow up to infinity. So we'll set the exponential term equal to zero. Stop messing around with that slider and just type it in. And now we see, you know, as we adjust C1 and C2, we 
adjusting C1 and C2, both of these things are causing this curve to collapse towards the x-axis. And I'm not going to just pretend to experiment. I'm going to select the values that I think will make this work. C2 equals negative 2. C1 equals positive 1. And we have managed to make this function appear identically equal to the zero function down here. And we managed to do it without making all of these coefficients equal to zero. C1 is not zero and C2 is not zero. So that tells you that these functions are dependent. And now that we have this definition of dependence and independence, I was getting a little ahead of myself when I talked about the general solution. But now we can talk about it. Assuming that we have n linearly independent solutions, we can use them to form the general solution. We saw this in the 2D case. I mean, we saw this in the second order case. If we have two linearly independent solutions, we can create the general solution. And now I'm saying that if we have a third order equation and we have three linearly independent solutions, we can create the general solution. If we have an nth order, linear homogeneous, again, this is really important, homogeneous differential equation. One, there are always n linearly independent solution. Two, these linearly independent solutions can be used to create the general solution using the superposition principle. So as I say, in this class, we're going to be looking at very specific um, examples of this. In this class, we're really only going to be looking at solution at well, first of all, at homogeneous equations. Second of all, at homogeneous equations with constant coefficients. And again, that's because linear differential equations 
are really most valuable as a tool for studying nonlinear differential equations. And for those purposes, we're only going to need to look at homogeneous equations. We're only going to need to look at constant coefficients. And the constant coefficients thing is just, we're never going to solve a linear equation with, con with, um, with non-constant coefficients in this class. But the other part, the, the homogeneous part, we'll just spend five or so minutes talking about. What if you've got a linear non-homogeneous differential equation. So the answer to this is going to be um, imperfect. I mean, assuming that you're trying to solve differential equations, pencil and paper, which is, you know, maybe not something you're usually trying to do. So, I mean, we've got P1 or P sub N, Y to the N, except that it's not really y to the n, it's the nth derivative of y and the n minus first derivative of y, and so on. And instead of a zero on the right, you have an f on the right. So you have some non-zero function to create a general solution. It's done in the parts first. No, let me put these in a different order than I was about to. Find a solution. So, great. To solve the differential equation, solve the differential equation. Um, but I mean, you might, for example, be able to use technology to solve, to find a solution. Or if you have a real world problem and you, you know, you are, you might be able to work it out. I think this solution should be exponential for such and such a reason. But somehow or other, you need to find a solution. Let's see, I've already used F. Let's call this solution G. Then, we replace F with zero. So now we have a homogeneous solution. G is a terrible choice. Um, H sub P. Two, replace this function F with zero and find 
the general solution H sub G. The reason I said G was a terrible choice in one is that I want to use G for general. And if you can do that, then the general solution to this non-homogeneous differential equation is gotten by adding those solutions together. Add the solution you found to the general solution of the homogeneous equation. And Just as a matter of curiosity, we're using a P there because this is normally called a particular solution. So, by double prime example, Y double prime plus four Y equals 12 X. So this is not homogeneous. Suppose you recognize somehow that this has as a particular to the solution 3x. So y double prime of 3x is 0. y prime of 3x is uh, not y prime, just y. 4 times 3x, that's supposed to equal 12x, and that is certainly true. 0 plus 4 times 3x does indeed equal 12x. So never mind how you get it, but we do find... Um, we do have, because I wrote it down for us, a particular solution. Let's pause class for a moment, or rather not pause class, but pause my lecture we learned how to solve something that looks like y double prime plus four equals zero Thursday last week. Why don't you go through your notes and see if you can figure this out? So, uh, Summing up for any online students who are watching this, um, this is the, the second case that we did on Thursday where there are complex roots. Um, it ends up because um, our real part is zero and e to the zero is one. The e to the ax that you normally have in front of the solution just turned into one, and we only are left with the sine and the cosine. And now y equals the particular solution plus the general solution. 
Um, notice that when you form a general solution, you get coefficients. There is a C1 in front of the cosine, and there is a C2 in front of the sine from when we form the general solution. There is not a C3 in front of the 3x. The particular solution just goes in um, without any coefficient in front of it. All right, a short section, again, that can I say short, about 40 minutes, that was by design, so that um, I would have time to answer any questions regarding the test. So let me not record that.